Felix Klein showed that the various kinds of geometry are all specializations of projective geometry. Synthetic projective morphology is the most consistent, the most fundamental, the purest, the most elegant, and dare we add, the most beautiful. It is the universal source of the other geometries. Hitherto, we have accorded all points, lines, and planes cosmically impartial treatment. Single out special elements, as in this projective grid, and you begin to incarnate. The Cartesian coordinate system is fuzzy at the edge. Tilt the plane, and you see this. To straighten the picture and incarnate more fully, just follow these simple instructions. Single out the most distant possible line, that is, the infinitely distant line of the plane. Call it the absolute line. Usually, the infinitely distant is tacitly assumed to be absolute, the fixed standard. Now you have symmetry. The midpoint between A and B is the harmonic conjugate with respect to A and B of the intersection of AB with the absolute line. And single out an exceptional pair of imaginary points in the infinitely distant line. Choose that pair represented by the only circling involution with no center of density in the infinitely distant line. The only one with omnidirectional symmetry. That is, the imaginary points circle at an unvarying pace. Call them the absolute points. Now you have right angles. Two lines are perpendicular when their intersections with the absolute line separate the imaginary absolute points harmonically. Hence, Euclid's right angle postulate. In space, you single out the infinitely distant plane as your special plane, and in every other plane, the infinitely distant line. And in the infinitely distant plane, the absolute imaginary circle. Euclidean geometry thus proves to be a special instance of projective morphology. This is another example of a backward stream of time. What is intrinsically prior appears historically later than its derivative. As for measurement, any growth measure with one of its double points on the absolute line marks a geometric series. Any step measure with its double double point on the absolute line marks equal intervals. Two spreads are equal when they meet the absolute line in point pairs, both standing in the same cross ratio to the absolute points. The center of a conic is its pole with respect to the absolute line. The asymptotes of a hyperbola are the tangents where it intersects the absolute line. Every conic intersects the absolute line twice. The hyperbola in two visible, the ellipse in two imaginary points. The parabola in a visible double point, that is, the absolute line is a line of the parabola. A circle is a conic in the absolute points. Diameters are lines in the center of a conic. Two of them are called conjugated diameters when they lie in each other's poles. Their poles lie in involution in the absolute line. 
the conic intersects the absolute line in the double points of this involution. The conjugated diameters separating the absolute points harmonically are the axes. The lines of the conic and their normals generate a breathing involution in the major axis and a circling involution in the minor. The double points are the foci. The polar of a focus is a directrix. Now we can recognize Euclidean theorems as special cases of more general projective truths. For instance, at any point on a circle, the tangent and the diameter are perpendicular. That is because the tangent must lie in the pole of the diameter, making this an example of conjugated diameters. The line joining the center of a circle with the midpoint of a chord is perpendicular to the chord. More conjugated diameters. By definition, the midpoint is the harmonic conjugate of the intersection of the secant with the absolute line. Therefore, that intersection is the pole of the diameter. Ready to polarize the whole of Euclidean geometry? To create a whole new complementary geometry? Single out any point to be the absolute point. That is the counter space infinity. Instead of extensive space, you establish intensive space. Just as our normal, incarnated, central consciousness experiences the absolute plane as infinite outwardness, an inside out, peripheral consciousness experiences the absolute point as infinite inwardness. In each of these two pictures, each sphere is the harmonic conjugate of the absolute with respect to its neighbors. But whereas in the picture on the left, the absolute is external, in the right, it is internal. The one group expands from a center, point-wise, the other is enveloped from the periphery, plane-wise, like a bud with an inwardly infinite free space within. In this sense, we may also speak of positive and negative space. In extensive space, a point progressing by equal distances never reaches the absolute line, because the distance is infinite. In intensive space, a line progressing by equal angles never reaches the absolute point, because the angle is infinitely great. Also, single out a pair of imaginary lines in the absolute point, namely that pair whose circling is undifferentiated, having no axis of density. That is in the plane. In space, it is an imaginary cone in the absolute point. In extensive geometry, two lines are perpendicular when their intersections with the absolute line separate the absolute points harmonically. In intensive geometry, two points are perpendicular when their connectors with the absolute point separate the absolute lines harmonically. In extensive space, two lines are parallel when they meet in the absolute plane. In intensive space, two points may be called centered when they meet in the absolute point. Here is a sample theorem in the plane. 
given a point and a line not in it, not the absolute line, there is exactly one line in the point parallel to the line. That is because the given line and the absolute line share exactly one point, which in turn shares exactly one line with the given point. That's right. Once you comprehend Euclidean geometry as a specialization of projective morphology, you can finally prove the parallel postulate. And just to show that counter space also has its proofs, given a line and a point not in it, not the absolute point, there is exactly one point in the line centered with the point. That is because the given point and the absolute point share exactly one line, which in turn shares exactly one point with the given line. Given two lines coplanar with the absolute point, their midline, analogous to the midpoint, is the harmonic conjugate of the line in the absolute point. In such comparisons, the pictures on the right sometimes vary more than those on the left. That is because in Euclidean extensive space, only the infinitely distant plane is absolute. Theoretically, any plane could be chosen, but the infinitely distant plane governs physically parallel surfaces, for instance, in crystals. In counter space, on the other hand, any point may serve as the absolute center, and in nature, many do. A multitude of negative spaces interpenetrates. Just as in positive space, the line connecting the midpoints here green of two sides of a triangle is parallel to the third side. So in counter space, the intersection of the midlines here green of two corners of a trilateral is centered with the third corner. Consider the pencil of four lines in P, A, B, C, and the absolute line. It lies in the harmonic range in one of the two sides of the triangle. Therefore, it is a harmonic pencil. Therefore, it also intersects the harmonic range in the other side in all four points. Of course, there is also a metric proof, but because these two geometries are complementary specialized versions of projective morphology, if you use the projective proof, you can simply polarize it. Consider the range of four points in P, A, B, C, and the absolute point. It lies in the harmonic pencil in one of the two corners of the trilateral. Therefore, it is a harmonic range. Therefore, it also intersects the harmonic pencil in the other corner, in all four lines. The lines connecting the corners of a triangle with the midpoints, here green, of the opposite sides, concur in the so-called centroid, or geometric barycenter, that is, the center of gravity. In a counterspace trilateral, the intersections of the sides with the midlines, here green, of the opposite corners, align in the axis of levity. This pair of theorems follows from the previous pair, namely, the three midpoints are a triangle, with sides parallel to those of the given triangle, that is, the two triangles are perspective from the absolute line. So by Desargues, they are also perspective from a center. And in counter space, the three midlines are a trilateral, with corners centered with those of the given trilateral. That is, the two trilaterals are perspective from the absolute point. So by Desargues, they are also perspective from an axis.
in a Euclidean plane, shown here in the lower left, shapes perspective from the absolute line and from a center in the absolute line are congruent. This kind of perspectivity is called translation. In counter-Euclidean morphology, shapes perspective from the absolute point and from an axis in the absolute point are congruent. This kind of perspectivity is called shear. When you shear all the way out and around, you flip. This means the yellow and the black segments are actually congruent in negative space. Now in a positive plane, the interior of a trilateral is that three-sided field of points not containing any points of the absolute line. In a negative plane, the interior of a triangle is that three-cornered field of lines not containing any lines of the absolute point. So what is usually called an interior angle is that segment of the corner, that is, that part of the pencil in the corner, lying in the interior. Correspondingly, in counter space, the interior segment of a side is the part in the interior of the triangle. In positive space, the interior segment of one corner is congruent with part of the exterior segment of another corner by translation. Repeat the procedure from the infinitely distant perspective center in the other side of the trilateral, and it turns out that the three interior point segments add up to a full point. In negative space, the interior segment of one side is congruent with part of the exterior segment of another side by shear. Repeat the procedure from the infinitely central perspective axis in the other corner of the triangle, and it turns out that the three interior line segments add up to a full line. The altitudes of a triangle, that is, the lines in the corners perpendicular to the opposite sides, concur in the orthocenter. Likewise, in a trilateral, the points in the sides perpendicular to the opposite corners align in the ortho axis. The perpendicular bisectors of a triangle are the perpendicular lines, here green, in the midpoints of the sides. They are always copunctual, namely in the circumcenter. The perpendicular bisectors of a trilateral are the perpendicular points, here green, in the midlines of the corners. They are always collinear, namely in the circumaxis. You will find that the circumaxis, the orthoaxis, the axis of levity, and other alignments concur in the counter-Euler point, analogous to the Euler line. Given two lines in a positive plane, not parallel, here black, the two lines that separate both them and the absolute points harmonically are the point segment bisectors, better known as angle bisectors. Given two points in a negative plane, not centered, here black, the two points that separate both them and the absolute lines harmonically are the line segment bisectors. A range of the second order 
in the absolute points shall be called a circle. For instance, the intersections of perpendicular lines in two points, whose midpoint is then the center of the circle, that is, the pole of the absolute line. In counter space, a pencil of the second order in the imaginary lines shall be called a circle. For instance, the connectors of perpendicular points in two lines whose midline is then the axis of the circle, that is, the polar of the absolute point. Here is a group of coaxial circles in counter space. Given two points in a plane, there is exactly one circle in B with A as center. That is because a curve of the second order is determined by a pole, its polar, and three points. A is the pole, the absolute line is the polar, and the curve lies in B and the two absolute points. Another Euclidean postulate proven. Given two lines in a plane, there is exactly one counter space circle in B with A as axis. That is because a curve of the second order is determined by a polar, its pole, and three lines. A is the polar, the absolute point is the pole, and the curve lies in B and the two absolute lines. In a plane of positive space, three points determine a circle. The center is the circumcenter, the intersection of the perpendicular bisectors. In a plane of counter space, three lines determine a circle. The axis is the circumaxis, the line joining the perpendicular bisectors. Here is another example. Mirroring in an extensive plane, also known as reflection, is harmonic perspectivity from a center in the absolute line and an axis perpendicular to the lines in that center. If the center of a circle lies in the axis of mirroring, the circle is mirrored into itself. Mirroring in a counter space plane is harmonic perspectivity from an axis in the absolute point and a center perpendicular to the points in that axis. If the axis of a circle lies in the center of mirroring, the circle is mirrored into itself. Two mirrorings make a rotation. The center of rotation in extensive space is the intersection of the axes of mirroring. Parallel translation is thus a special version of rotation, namely, one whose center lies in the absolute line. In counter space, the line joining the centers of mirroring is the axis of rotation. Shear is thus a special version of counter space rotation, namely, one whose axis lies in the absolute point. Here is a full rotation. Each corner moves in a circle, whose axis is of course the axis of rotation. This triangle rotates on smaller circles, that is, close to the axis and far from the infinite center. Here is a counter space coordinate system. Like the Cartesian system, shown on the left for comparison, it is scaled in step measure. The x center and the y center are perpendicular. A line is denoted by a pair of coordinates. A point has an equation. 
relating the two coordinates of each of its lines. The circle too has an equation for its lines. For instance, 0, 2 and 2, 0, which you can see are tangents. Counter space is more than just a question of kitchen design. The possibility of such a complementary geometry was first posited by Felix Klein, but only investigated half a century later by Rudolf Steiner, and then described geometrically by two of his students, Georg von Kaufmann, better known as George Adams, and Louis Locher Ernst. Olive Witcher, Lawrence Edwards, Nick Thomas, and others have shown some initial applications. Its development is only beginning.